Welcome to Adapt and Close, and thank you to selecting to watch this video. This is an endless review on sleep and pain management. In order to do questions and do content, I will do like four questions to highlight some points, do the content itself. Then we do additional seven or eight questions to consolidate what we have learned. So let's get to it. First question, straightforward a question, select or apply. You pick those you know, you're confident, right? Um, and this is a read from the back, which of the following suiting technique the nurse should provide to the mother, right? A nurse is taking care of a newborn five days old. Which of the following suiting technique the nurse should provide to the mother? You need to teach them how to take care of a baby when the baby is crying. Therefore, I call this the six X because I include the uh, suiting into it. So swaddle, you hold them, you swaddle the baby, you know, like a camel, you swaddle them. Um, then um, you provide some silence so that they don't disturb them. And you suit them as part of the soothing technique, skin to skin, let them touch you, kangaroo form, right? You provide some sugar for them, sucrose, and you provide some suckling, so six X, adding the soothing technique. So adding silent, soothing, skin to skin, sucrose and suckling sex technique to take care of these patients. One down. Two, PCA. Very confusing, but straightforward. Which statement is accurate? A client was prescribed 0.2 milligram hydromorphine with a lockout of what? 10 minutes and a 1.2 an hour. You're happy to be able to interpret it. So two milligram, 10 minutes lockout. This is the way you should write it. And then 1.2 milligram. The lockout means the computer is going to stop. Uh, the PCA will not give you anything. Then you go back and you said, how many minutes are in an hour, right? There's 60 minutes, right? That means if there's 10 lockouts, 60 over 10 is six. So the patient can get something only six times because when I push at one minute, I have to wait. The lockout means 10 minutes to be able to push, to get something. I can push in five minutes, I'm not getting anything. Six minutes, I'm not getting anything. Seven minutes, I'm not getting anything. I have to wait 10 minutes every time I push. And then if I push at the 10th minute, I get something. I have to wait another 10 minutes, which is the 20 minutes before I can get something. So in an hour, the only time I can push to get a drag it's only six times. If you push it 400 times, you're only going to get the drug six times. So it does not matter how many times you push, you're not going to get drug every time you push because of the lockout of 10 minutes. And the maximum I can get is 1.2 and the minimum is 0.2, right? So a client will only get 0.2 in an hour. No, he can get a maximum 1.2. Client will get a maximum of one, no, you get 1.2. A client will receive 1.2 milligram every push. Every push is getting 0.2, not 1.2. A client will have to wait every 10 minutes after push to receive a dose from the PCA. And this is the writing because of the lockout. Wait 10 minutes. Number three, two is that. Number three. A nurse is taking, teaching new graduate about pain management. Which of the following the nurse should include in the teaching? Pain is very, very important that you have to know. And they will trap you with that. Objective data are essential. No way. It's not objective. It's not what you think. You know, you can measure somebody's pain. That's objective. Most clients mix up the level of their pain. They do not. You need identify source. You, that's not, you don't need any source to tell me that I have pain. If I told you I'm in pain, I am in pain. You got to take it. So pain is subjective. The person saying it, if he said 100, 101 over 10, is take it as 101 over 10. It is whatever the client says. That is something you have to know. Pain is whatever I say it is. If I say I have zero pain, you take it like that. If I say I have five 
pain, five out of 10, you take it like that. Why would you take one out of five pain, uh, one out of 10, and when I said, I mean, nine out of 10, you said, you tell me I'm lying. If you take this as true, then you should take these two. Whether I show it or not, it does not matter. Number four. What is the assessment the client is referring to? You have to know the quality and the staff, certain things about pain, right? So um, a client told, um, told the nurse that the pain comes, the pain, okay, this is a description, pain comes and go, and it's intermittent. So my pain is intermittent and comes and go. What comes and go? What does that mean? Is the quality? No, they will tell you seven out of 10. Or sharp or dull. Location, it will tell you is located on the left or right. Severity, yeah, they can tell you 10 out of uh, um, 10. The quality will describe sharp, dull, or anything like that. And timing is when it comes. It comes and go, and it's intermittent. So that's the timing. It's referring to timing of the pain. So that is the four, first four questions I'm taking care of. Now, let's go over sleep. Sleep is straightforward. I will just focus on the stages and things you need to prevent. Okay, there are what? Um, four stages of sleep. And they're very, very important. Okay, the first stage is non-rapid high movement. That is non-RAM sleep, which is stage one. And usually these last for 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes maximum. What does he, and he start from the time of what? Wakefulness. When you are awake, when you try to sleep, you know, that's the time to sleep. So when you lay down, and you, you get into the time you're going to deep sleep, yeah, yeah or getting to the beginning of your sleep, that's what we call stage one sleep. So um, from the time of wake wakefulness, you, you're still a little bit awake and you're going to sleep. So that's the stage one and it lasts for like five to 10 minutes, that's right. In this stage, the reason why we call it this way is the brain and start to slow down. That's the beginning of the brain slowing down, okay? Uh, your heart rate goes down. You have to know some of the things because they can ask you. Heart rate goes down. That's the way you can distinguish uh, between um, all these stages, right? Your breathing start to go down because you're getting relaxed, okay? Your high movement also starts to go down. So they, that's the beginning, but you have not gone down yet. Okay, your body start to relax. Okay, you go into the mode, but your muscle can twitch. Okay, they are not um, completely gone yet. So they can twitch, right? You can be aroused, somebody can touch you, call your name, and so uh, you, can, you can hear it and you can wake up right away from that sleep. And when you call the person, they say, oh, you tell them they're sleeping. That's no, I'm not sleeping because they are in the stage one. They're getting there. Um, the brain is very active. This is the brain is active. That's why you call their name. They will hear about it. Um, and this is the kind of, in case they ask you for the wave, this is state of waves. Um, it's a slow wave and it's located on the frontal lobes. And so they can figure out what is going on with them. Um, this is, we. you can also describe this as light sleep it's just a light sleep where most people try to do that so that is the first stage of sleep simple and straightforward the second stage okay um stage two is different now you're progressing as you go um you you basically have sleep here you are not completely so i can say half asleep but you are not also completely gone, but it's better than stage two, right? Um, it can last for 30 to 60 minutes. You're still there, uh, but not going yet. Um, but you are less aware of your surroundings comparing to, so when I call you, you will not try to get up anymore, less aware uh, of the surrounding. Basically, you are not aware. Your temperature start dropping now.
that's when your temperature begin to drop. Okay, um, you 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 begin to uh, um, drop, and then you your high movement you stop instead of slowing down. The high movement is now stopped. It's not slowing down. Your heart doesn't move anymore. Your heart rate and your breathing basically they start to like going down. But they will become regular now. They're going down by this regular, but slowly getting down. Okay. It's very, very, very important that you get this kind of uh, um, sleep. There's two things that happen that every book talk about in case you're reading the book and you can find them. Um, we hear about it all the time, medical school. K complexes, I just don't know what they call them. There's one called K complexes. This is what makes you know about your surrounding. Okay, so this you are aware of your surrounding. And then there's uh, sleep spindles. I will explain it later. Okay, uh, sleep and uh, spindles. It reduces stimuli. These two things. The first one, the K complex, usually make us be aware of our surrounding. So K complex, and then the sleep spindles reduces stimuli. But in when you sleeping, especially the K uh, um, complex. It, it basically dump down and make you stay asleep, asleep so that nobody um, can disturb you. These are the two things that help you remain asleep. Even though the care complex is out, make you aware when you're not sleeping, aware of your surrounding in your brain, it's a, uh, waves in your brain. When you start sleeping, it make you remain asleep and this uh, uh, sleep spindles come in place and both of them keep you um, asleep in their stage two sleep. So that's what help you that. Otherwise you will, you will, you'll be awake. Okay, so these are the, uh, um, the second stage. Okay, the, the third stage, so it's also non-rapid high movement um, stage three. Okay, see, so this is very, the most important. These are slow, deep, we call it deep, slow wave now you are probably gone deep slow wave uh, before I, I i remember something this here this is where memory start you start to remember things that happen um during the day and you start to consolidate consolidate your sleep uh, your memory you put them together all the things and they become part of your memory so you consolidating your memory at that stage um, so let's go back to stage three, where you have sleep, uh, deep sleep moment. This is very important. No matter what will happen, you know, in the, in the stage two, the case complexes and the sleep spindle try to keep you asleep. At this stage, nothing can wake you up. You're gone. Unfortunately, when you get older, this is changes, you lose that opportunity. But at this stage, if you are not old and you are in middle age, nothing can wake up, you're basically gone. It's just like completely gone. Um, and then the, you know, what is going to happen is your blood pressure, your breathing, your BP and breathing also go down, basically slows down. And it's the deepest of all the sleep. Most people who sleepwalk, they're working in a, um, this, this stage, sleepwalking. So if they give you a question and say somebody is sleepwalking, yeah, this is the stage they undergo sleepwalking. This is the stage. Um, the most important here is. This is where if you don't have good sleep hygiene, this is where you get into trouble. This is where your body repair itself, repair all injury. And so this is where you have your rest, rest for the night. So that when you wake up in the morning, you feel 
fresh. Therefore, if you're not getting this kind of sleep, you are in trouble. If your sleep never enter you into stage two, three stage, yeah, you're going to get, uh, you will not be able to repair your body. Uh, so when you wake up, you'll be tired all the time. People get tired and they'll be sleeping during the day. So uh, sleeping during the day because they don't have enough um, non-rapid eye movement and stage three sleep. It's a big problem. Um, these last um, for, I forget to tell you, this last for 20, 20, you spend 20 to 40 minutes here, like that. So, but it's very important. That's where you start repairing all your injury to your body, all the things you've been running, all the things you've done to help you that. Um, you continue to uh, consolidate your memory memory here, you put it together and then it become more consolidated. You can form good memory over here. Very, very important stage. Um, and it's the non-rapid high movement type uh, stage three. Stage four is, is rapid eye movement. So you can see one, two, three are uh, non-rapid eye movement. This is rapid eye movement. The reason why we call it is your eye is moving first, fast. So this is, this is stage four, for sleep. Some people will call it what? Paradoxical, paradoxical, um, paradoxical sleep. Why? This is the key. Your eyes is moving so fast, rapid high movement, okay? That's rapid high movement, but your body is paralyzed. You cannot move, you can't move anything. The rest of the body is paralyzed. You feel like you are awake. There's a lot of brain activity. And then your eyes moving so fast, right? But your body does not move. It does not move at all. It does not move at all. It's very important. I'll come back to it. There's a disease process that do that. Okay. Um, and this is what happened. Um, your brain is moving so fast. Your eye is moving. Your breathing become irregular. You see, you move from irregular to regular. Now it's going to irregular again. Irregular breathing. Uh, your eyes, I said, is moving. And then you have dreams here. Vivid dreams is here. Vivid dreams. This is where you dream. It's stage four. If you don't have dreams, it's because you're lacking stage four and uh, sleep. So that's where you dream most of it. And you consolidate your memory also. But just to let you know that your breathing becomes fast, irregular. Your body, though, is relaxed and then your eye is moving. There is a disorder called rapid eye movement sleep disorder. What did I say? Body is paralyzed, right? But your eye is moving. Your brain activity is really working. These people who have a rapid eye movement sleep disorder, they start acting out their dreams. So whatever dreams they're having during the vivid time, they start flicking their, their, their hand, moving their hand, shouting, they just kicking their body. It's because they have this disorder. Most people at this stage, your body doesn't move, but your eye is moving, but the whole body is paralyzed. These people are able to act out their dreams. So they will be kicking you if you sleep with them. They will be kicking you, punching you, because that's what they're seeing. If they're here, if sleeping like that, and they have this disorder. So if they give you a question like that, what is rapid eye movement sleep disorder? And people who act out their dreams during the uh, rapid eye movement stage. Um, this, um, the total amount of, um, um, this takes about 50% of your sleep. So throughout the night, 50% you hear, half of it you hear. So this alone takes a large amount of your sleep, okay, compared to the other three. So most of the time we have rapid eye movement and that 
It takes, these are key fact, it takes 90 minutes from stage one, two, three, to get to here, 90 minutes. And so you're able to complete one cycle of sleep from 90 to 120 minutes. So if somebody falls asleep, within 90 to 120 minutes, they've moved from one, two, three, four stage, right? Therefore, if there's, you sleeping for like probably eight hours a night, usually you go into what? Five cycle. So five cycle of, we go through five cycle of sleep. If we have full eight hours, we go from stage one, two, three, and four, and we keep on repeating the cycle, it takes like 90 minutes. So we end up having like five cycle of sleep um, throughout the night. Uh, it because it take 90 to 120 minutes to get to um, finish one cycle. Okay, this is very important. As you, if you want to take a good nap, this is the technique. You should not take a nap that is two hours. I'm just using, this is knowledge I used when I was in medical school. Don't take a, a nap that is two hours because if you take it like that, you've already moved them from the rapid eye movement sleep, probably you start in stage one again or two, it become a problem. To get a full complete cycle to rest, you have your memory and body, give yourself between 90 and 120 minutes nap. That means it's a good nap. You finish one full cycle of sleep. That's the key fact you have to know, okay? And so that's the when it's something you have to know. And so that's the one portion of it. The other thing too is not everybody who progresses through this. Okay, so this is the normal progression of sleep. Okay, so you start from stage one, you go to two, you go to three. Okay, some people go to back to two, then go to four. And then they go back to two. Most people never go back to one. Okay, so so that's the um, stages um, usually happen. Let me clean it. I will. I will say it again. Nobody go through a full cycle. Some people um, get into trouble. They get wake. They get step. But the usual full cycle when you go through, this is how you rotate. You start from stage one, you go to stage two, three, um, and then you can go back to two then before you go to four, okay? Um, and that's the cycle. And after four, you go to two. You try not to go to one, otherwise you wake up. You body try to give you. And then you go to two and you repeat the cycle back and back. Some people cannot do that. They get interrupted and they keep on repeating. That's why they don't have normal sleep, like a sleep apnea. So you can progress by stage one, two, three, go to two, repeat, and then stage four, and then you keep on doing the cycle. So that's the key fact you have to know, okay? So that's first thing gone. Now, the other thing Anklis will ask you is about hygiene, sleep hygiene and other stuff. So before that, you know, some, we talk about, so if somebody have effect of, uh, um, he, he, they, they have a sleeping issue, okay? You can see effect of uh, lack of sleep. Yeah, if you have a lack of sleep, what is the problem? You're going to lose, stage three issue, right? That's where you rest your body. And then you're going to lack this. This is where you have your memory. And so you get tired, you don't have, you don't, you can't dream, you feel tired. So it's very, very important that you know all these things, right? So insomnia, somebody tell you they have insomnia. This is what Anklis will ask you. So it's difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, it's both, right? There's factors that can do that. So factors that can influence that. 
So factors that influences this problem. There's so many things that can do that. One, if you're anxious, anxiety is something coming up. Your ankles is coming up. You can't sleep. I mean, it can affect your sleep, right? You're stressed about everything, right? That's the problem. And then if you take two nap naps during the day, this can also affect you. That's like, it usually affects you bigly, in a big way. Okay, if you have, you drink, you take alcohol before you go to sleep, another problem. Smoking, yeah, they are all stimulant, okay? You exercise less than um, four hours. So less than four hours before you go to sleep, that's also a problem, okay? Um, so you exercise before med time or you take some medication, certain medication can affect your sleep. And therefore, you tell this is what you tell the patient. These are the teaching. So teaching provided to the patient sleep in a, what cool environment. Don't make the place warm. Make sure it's quiet, right? Quiet environment. That's key, right? Very very important. Um, provide them with a relaxing technique so that they can relax themselves before they go to bed, right? Use the bed for sleep and nothing else. You don't go and lay down and trying to get a sleep first. You have to make sure you're ready to sleep. These are teaching you teach the patient. If they are in bed in 20 minutes, they have no fall asleep, get out. Make sure you don't drink too much water before you go to sleep. Otherwise your bladder will be full and then you have to wake up. Don't eat full meal before you go to sleep. That's another thing you should, you should know. A small snack like carbohydrate is good. It's good for you. It will catch you sleeping. Carbohydrate will make you fall asleep by a small one, right? No, no alcohol or smoking less than four to six hours before sleep. No, you stay awake. And that's very, very important. These are the things you teach this patient to do. There is a non uh, um, uh, pharmacological means. So non farm is a you can do CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, to help the people to sleep. You can also do a relaxing technique. Um, and then progressive muscle, you've heard it before, progressive muscle uh, rehabilitation, and just to help them get them into the mood and sleep. Of course, if they cannot, yeah, we have medication that you can give them, melatonin, and uh, sometimes antidepressant um, can be used. For melatonin, you have to know that it causes vivid dreams. So you got to tell the patient. So vivid dreams is one of the complications. And so this is the things that I many you need for the, um, the endless, um things that can affect your sleep. And you change this into teaching. That's all. What are the things that will affect you in teaching? So if the patient is admitted to the hospital, you use the same thing and you flip it back to yourself. You say, oh, if I'm in the ICU and I'm not seeing daylight, you expect me not to sleep. I'll go confused. So open the blind, let them see daylight. Don't let them take a nap. Um, you know, make sure there's not too much noise. Make sure the light is not on, you know, lightning. All those things is very, very important um, to help them fall asleep. And this is the first portion of the lecture uh, about um, sleeping. Um, okay, so let's get to. So now let's do some pain. Pain is, like we talk about, is subjective. 
It's what I tell you it is. It's where you got to take it. There's different kind of pain. So we classify pain. I classify it. Um, I think I do it the way it make it easy for me is time. So time is acute versus chronic. So I will do that first. And then. So that's the way I divide it into time, two things, time and acute. Time, acute and chronic. Acute means it just basically something that just happened right away is very protective. Okay. These are keywords they always use very um, protective, it's temporary, it will go away, it's self limiting. You will stop causing the problem. And it usually does not last until it, it, it will last for a few minutes and it will go away after the inflammation is gone or tissue injury gone. And most of the time um, is due to tissue injury, basically. And it's an adaptive. So in order to run away from it, something is not right. Your body tell you, hey, I got to run away from it. So it's an acute pain. It's self-limiting and that. What is the biggest issue? There is a physiological. There is a physiological uh, response to pain. Okay, so you will see blood pressure up, heart rate up respiratory rate up in this patient you see things that is moving they will be sweaty those are all physiological manifestation um and these are changes they will be apprehensive um they will do things that um will tell you that they are in pain there's also going to be some behavioral changes right they will be grimacing right they um they will be mourning Patient will be guarding if you're touching their abdomen. These are all signs in telling you, or uh, they've been flinching, that these are all behavioral changes that you see for them. And that is the duration portion of it. Chronic, that means if this one is protective, this is not protective. I try to make it easy as much as possible. That's the only way I can understand it. And it's ongoing, it's not time limited. And usually if the pain lasts for three minutes, three months, that's considered a chronic pain. Even it will persist, even after tissue has healed, it's going to continue. So when your pain is still there after your tissue has healed, it's because it's a chronic pain. The key fact is, these people will not show physiologic changes. So don't consider them as that they lie. You don't see their virus. So virus does not change. So it doesn't mean they lying. They're just telling the truth. The things you should be worrying for is depression. They will be tired their functioning will be affected. And so those are the things you look for, this chronic pain, um, that these are the way they, they, they will show it, right? So those are the things. Um, example of somebody who have a chronic pain, it's like your osteoarthritis, right? Somebody with osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. You have like chronic pain, cancer patient, Acute pain is like surgery. You just had surgery and it cuts your skin. It's the tissue injury. So your body is responding, say, hey, I'm not happy, I'm not happy. Somebody fix me, fix me, fix me. So that's what you do. So that's one type of pain. So this is one. Okay, so those are the, uh, the way I, um, you can classify um, those kind of pain. Right, there is another kind of pain due to physiology, right? It's a physiological pain. And then we'll, we, the physiology is basically, this is divided into, it's not time, but it's divided, you can have nauseous receptors, basically nauseous stimuli, 
is right. Uh, you know, to resort a uh, kind of pain versus neuropathic. Easy way, okay. This one, there is a nauseous and, and something, something tissue is dying. There's something that um, is cause, causing the nerves, okay. Nerves are being stimulated, that's all. But they are not damaged. So something is being produced from tissue damage or inflammation that is causing this um, tissue to basically release their chemicals and they stimulate the nerves. Um, usually when you have tissue damage, all these things happening, you can have like prostaglandins. That's why you use anti-inflammatory. Uh, you can have bradycanin. Uh, release, you can have hydrogen ion, uh, you can have serotonin. These are what is released from dying tissue and they stimulate the nerves and the nerves then fire. And so those are nauseous stimuli basically. So those are some of the pain we see. And it's due to, not due to nerve damage, uh, but it's the nerve is being stimulated by tissue or inflammation that is damaging. This is normal pain um, phenomenon, basically. This is basically what it's supposed to be. It's not abnormal. It's true pain because something is stimulating them, right? So that is physiological and this thing. And that you can have somatic, okay? Somatic pain is usually, is localized and it's sharp. Okay, and you can get it from like your muscle, your tendon, your skin. Okay, those are all localized. Your joint, it will tell you, my knee is hurting. Yeah, it's localized pain or connective tissue. These are all where you can get this kind of pain from. These are somatic kind of pain. It's localized and sharp. Unlike visceral, Look at the word visceral. It's from visceral organs. These are internal organs, and they are not not localized. Okay, and they are dull. They are not sharp. So dull kind of pain. Uh, you cannot pinpoint where they're coming from. The another characteristics is this can be referred. They can be referred to some place. So usually visceral pains are those that get referred to another organ because where the nerve, um, another location because of where the nerve goes through. And that's why you have a heart attack. It's, um, it can get referred or if you have abdominal pains, the certain pains in the like appendicitis, which is a visceral pain, can get referred to your, um, uh, and to the, the, uh, the backside or if you have gallbladder problem, it can refer to the right shoulder. So these are referred pain. So referred pain uh, is coming from visceral pain that is going somewhere. Okay, so those are the difference between them. Okay, let's clean it. So we're doing physiological, we done not receptive and pain. On physiological, the second portion is a neuropathic. And so since and also receptive pain is due to basically nerve being stimulated, this means there's true damage to the nerve. It can be central or peripheral. So this can be central or peripheral, uh, but there's some damage to the nerve, okay? And then an example is like somebody who has phantom um, limb pain. When you cut the nerve, like you have a, they, they, they cut it, they did a below knee amputation, BKA or AKA. They cut your leg, the nerve get damaged. So they then the nerve form a, um, a, a tissue that can stimulate and it can cause you pain uh, for a long time. Or you know, if you have a spinal cord injury, the nerve is completely damaged and you start having kind of pain. This pain will be described as shooting. They are shooting pain, okay? They are intense. Uh, they can be burning. 
Sometimes you feel like it's pins and needles. These are, these are the way the patient will describe those pains. So that's the way um, the two things I can tell you about these two. So if they give you a question, you know, phantom pain, limb pain, all those things, visceral pain, um, somatic pain, this is what they're referring to, okay? You have to know how to characterize somebody's pain. That's what we do, right? Assessment, when you're doing your assessment, yeah, you do you know what P Q R S T. It's the same thing you can use here. So and uh, the the what is causing the pain? Precipitating. Precipitating factors, right? That's the P. The Q is the quality, right? The R is the region or location, or if it's being referred somewhere, it's radiating somewhere, right? Um, then S, you know the severity of the pain. It's the same thing, you, you already know how to do that. Uh, when you do assess some of the pain, and T is the timing, right? So timing, timing is referred to intermittent, constant, severity, how, match the pain, where is it going, and the quality, uh, sharp on door, precipitated, won't make it worse or not. So the patient will tell you all those things. Um, and once, once again, pain is subjective. Whatever the, whatever the patient say it is, it is, no matter what, right? Now, factors that can affect pain. They can ask you this. Your past experience is key. If you've had a bad experience with pain, guess what? Your pain threshold, you know what to say about that. Culturally, you know, where I'm from, men is not supposed to cry. So they have pain, they don't, they won't cry, you know? They know they have pain within them, but culture, your cultural aspect of it can affect that. Age, right? If you're a kid, you can't express it. And so nobody knows. Older patients, they have other problems. So young and old are the one who have issue. Young person cannot talk about it. Older patient has so many things causing pain. Sometimes they ignore the other ones, right? Um, this can affect it. Uh, genetics is almost the same thing as the, you know, um, what I talk about, about your experience. Um, so, and if you have a psychotic problem, like an anxiety, if your anxiety about that um, pain is already high, it's going to be a problem. If you don't have support system, this can also affect your, your pain threshold. And so these are things that we got to pay attention to when we're analyzing somebody's pain. Okay, now we got to manage the pain. There's a strategy, right? You have non-pharmacological. Always start from non-pharmacological if you can do it. And it's a list of them, right? It's a list of them. So you release stress. So stress relief, take away stress. So yoga is good, right? Meditation is good, right? You can distract the patient, right? They can use natural remedy. There's nothing wrong with it. That's what they want to use, right? Um, relaxation. So progressive relaxation. You can do that. Um, they can also do a, even acupuncture, right? Acupuncture is another form, right? You can use acupuncture. Uh, you can also do back rub, right? You can uh, massaging, I guess. You can use it and cold to help. Hypnosis, if you can do that for the patient, these are all, um, and therapeutic touch. You can touch them therapeutically. But you got to pay attention 
to culture. If the culture does not allow you touching them, don't touch them. Okay, so these are form of um, method to control somebody's pain, non-pharmacological. Of course, pharmacological, we got to give them farm. The key thing is IV or parental. Sometimes they use this. It's only good for immediate short-term acute pain. It does not help. It just take care of it quickly. But if you need a longer form of pain duration, yeah, it's not IV is not good. So aura is better for chronic non-fluctuating pain. It's chronic, so you give them something or that can last. Acute pain, it acts short immediately, but it does not last long. Even though you take care of it immediately, it's for short-lived immediate pain. If I have a chronic pain that lasts longer, don't give me IV pain medication. It does not help. What is the strategy? Non-opioid is always first line of defense. So aspirin and SAIDs are your friend. They're very good. They can take care of uh, this problem. And they're good for what? Well, it's mild to moderate pain. That's what we use them for, and SAID and aspirin. Narcotic is for moderate to severe pain. And narcotic are like morphine, right? All the opiate that you know, fentanyl, hydromorphine. These are all tremidol. These are all percocet. They are like opiate. So they are narcotic. So you give them for um, these um, um, this kind of pain management. Okay. There is another group, though, we call them adjuvant. You've seen them. Basically, they help in with it. They just help with the psychological aspect and the no neuropathic kind of pain. Um, we can, they're very, very good. Um, and then they adjuvant because they do so many things, they act in different way. And they sit certain class of medication. So anti core convulsants like um, carbamazepine. It's a seizure medication, right? Um, a very anti-anxiety medication, you know, like diazepam. This also can be used for pain, TCA, right? Very good. We use it for back pain. It's antidepressant, but it's very dangerous. Antitriplin. Okay, antihistamines. There's some antihistamines that can you, you can use. And this one, Adalox. Yeah, I don't know if you heard about it before. Adroxyzine can also be used for that. So these are adjuvant medications. So when we say a client is on multi-modal pain meds, he's talking about is on what? Non-opiate, that means he's on NSAIDs, he's on opiates, and is on adjuvant therapy, like one of the antidepressant and all those things, medication joined together to help with the management of their pain. Sometimes we give them trastamol medication, and this is good for somebody who has chronic pain. It's very, very good. So let me put it here because this is a high yield fat. I got to put it somewhere. So if I'm taking care of a chronic patient, somebody with chronic pain, I need to make sure they have long acting PO, like opiate or medicaid, yeah, basically, right? They have a transdermal medication too. Either the long acting is either transdermal or oral form, yeah. If they need something around the crop, we call it ATC around the crop. Something they can get it as a baseline to help with that. And they will need a referral 
uh, to pain management. But you have to always make sure they're getting something um, around the clock. They are something long acting and something a breakthrough to help with their pain. Okay. Now, we did a question uh, on the PCA. PCA, patient control anesthesia. So, so patient analgesic. All it means is, okay, patient is in charge of it. So patient in charge. Family member can't push. Nurse cannot push. All of them cannot push. Family member nurse, you cannot push. Only patient push. You don't get any meds if you don't push. Therefore, we give it to patient who is awake, alert, and reliable to push their pain medication for meds. You, just, you cannot just give somebody who is intubated PCA. You can do that. So somebody who is awake, alert, can follow instruction, and they can push the medication. Yeah, we give it to them. So that's the key fact. And then they will give you a reading. So I give you one milligram of morphine, 10 minutes, lockout. And you can, I say, um, maximum is five milligram an hour. Okay, so that means the patient will get one milligram every time they push every 10 minutes. So 20 minutes, they can push, they can get one milligram. 30 minutes, they push, they get one milligram. 40 minutes, they push, they get one milligram. 50 minutes, they push, they get one milligram. 60 minutes, that's an hour, they get one milligram. So in an hour, they can get one, two, three, four, five, six. They can get total of six milligram an hour. But if I put just five milligram, they will only get five. So I'm cheating them, but because I want them to survive, you know, you know. So even though the way is locked out, they can get sex, but I've also programmed the machine to give them only five milligram. But sometimes pharmacy check and make sure the calculation is right. So they will tell you where this patient need to get six milligram so that in every time, so that every 10 minutes when they push, they get something at least, you know. But some people will not give them, even though it's a lockout 10 minutes and they can get six milligram. Some people can just put the maximum five. So there is one 10 minutes, they will not get anything. So, but that is an adaptive way of doing that. Okay. And the lockout is basically locking them up. So you have to be able to interpret this in case they give you a question. Before we end, I think like you have to know certain things about kids. Kids is always. So there are certain tools you can use to measure kids. First one is two months to seven years. This is what we use, the flag uh, chart to help uh, find kids' pain, right? It's very, very important. F is the face, right? The L is the legs right? and activity. And then the crying and whether you can console them. You got to know the stage, consolability, so you can console them. This is usually graded zero to two. If it's worse, they get two. If they're doing normal thing, they get zero. Normal thing, they get zero, right? That's what you use. Two months to seven years is good. Um, and three years and older, you can also do some face um, chart. The face chart, though, is, is different from another one. Look, it's a happy, um, basically, they draw happy and sad face, they draw it, they tell you, and they, then they rate their pain. It's run over zero out of five. It's different from the Hoja, which is three years to 13. This one, you show them photograph of pain, of people faces with pain. That's the difference. This one, you draw it, and then they, they show it to you. Okay. Now, um, 
the setting if the patient is not communicating, yeah, not communicating. Yes, so you have to look at other factors to be able to observe them and look at your social interaction, look at the, their face, look at their body language, and what you're doing, leg movement, um, or you're using all those, the physical ability, you can use the flag as a form also to help you get some information about their pain. And finally, an infant, that you need some soothing is the six X we talk about, like right, swaddle the kid and provide some silent environment. Suit the kid, skin to skin. Make sure they suckling, you know, and then provide them some sucrose. And this is um some of the key facts. I mean, I wanted to give it guys. Um, about pain. Of course, you have to know side effect of opiates. They're going to ask you, you know, respiratory depression, hypotension, constipation, urinary retention, all are signs and, and symptoms of uh, um, opioid overdose. And when you're opiate, therefore you provide them with something to prevent constipation. The normal one priority is respiratory depression. So if I give you a question um, on opiate, somebody has an opiate, don't worry about um, constipation or urinal retention. Respiratory depression is the key. Okay, so now let's continue with our questions. Right. Number five, select order that apply. The client was admitted to the ICU and report insomnia, can't sleep. Which of the following the next should include in the plan of care? Establish routine schedule, excellent. Turn off the monitor alarm, no way. If there's something is happening, the alarm stay on, but you can provide um, some form of silence, but the alarms, no, alarms don't go. If they're going to VTAC, I want to hear it. So this is not true. But you got to select those with confidence. Next generation. If you know, you know it, pick it. If you don't, leave it alone so that you don't lose a point. Open the blinds during the day, yes, yeah, so that it can, the circadian rhythm will come back. They know it's daytime and they don't fall asleep. Listen to light music before sleep. This is the relaxation technique. Keep the room temperature on the warmer side. No, cold temperature help you sleep much better. So one, three, five, four is the right answer. Select or apply, three answers, okay? You pick those you know, okay? And that will improve your chance of getting more point. Okay. Select or apply, same thing. Which of the following the next will anticipate? A client sleep study shows decreased time in non-rapid stage three sleep. This is content, you gotta bring it to yourself. Stage three, our ask is what? Select or apply, what is the content? I need to know if I'm not getting stage three sleep, what is going to happen to me? This is where what? You recover. There is no recovery mode and some memory. You're not going to be, get rested. And therefore you're not going to be alert during the day. You see, I use the content to crack this down. Daytime sleepiness, right? Which of the following the next will anticipate? I'm not going to be alert. I'll be sleeping during the day. I'll be tired and I will be irritable. I don't have sleep apnea. Just one word, recovery. I use it to knock other answers around. Two, three, four is the right answer. So I won't be alert, but I'll be sleeping during the day. I'll be tired and I'll be irritable. Norma, the next note that this is due to what? A male client act out. I act out my his vivid dreams during sleep. I told you, right? Rapid eye movement is where you, you have dreams. 
but your muscles is all paralyzed. You don't move it so that you don't act out. If I'm acting out, then my rapid eye movement disorder. Periodic limb movement means you sleeping and you moving your leg uh, just like that, but you are not acting out. Obstructive sleep apnea, you know, you just stop sleeping. Uh, breathing and you wake up. Narcolepsy, you fall in asleep like a drop attack during the day. So this one. Number eight. Sakta, right? Pick those you know. Six answer choice. There may be only one answer choice that is right. We do the following need immediate intervention. I need to intervene. Wrong answer. Yeah. And this is teaching a new graduate on how to educate a client on sleep hygiene. So what do you include in your sleep hygiene? Yoga before bed? Yes, I don't need intervention. Avoid alcohol four to eight hours before bed? Yeah, I don't need intervention. Full large meal before bed? No, you should not do that. Yoga is good, so yoga before bed, no intervention. You avoid alcohol, but if you eat large meal before bed, yeah, you're in trouble, you're not sleeping. Moderate exercise, yes, yeah, that's good. Four hours before, read in bed while waiting to fall asleep. I need to intervene. You're not going to sleep. Drink two to three liters before sleep. Your bladder will be full. You wake up multiple times. So three, five, and six are your right answer. And number nine. A client reports lack of dream during sleep. Which stage of the sleep is affected? You know, it's, this is where we dream. This is where we rest. And this is where we get better to get you here. This is the beginning of our sleep. This is where we don't want to move anymore. Your body basically, you cannot be disturbed. Here, you start relaxing your body, resting your body, and in the RAM sleep, you basically start dreaming. So this is the area that is affected. A client wants to know the longest part of the sleep to avoid waking up during that part of the sleep. Which stage would the nurse select? This is not long, this is the shortest. This is, you're getting warm up, a little warm up. And here you spend 50% of your sleep in the uh, rapid eye movement stage. And that's where you like to be most of the time. And the last one. This one is the bonus question. Which of the following is normally appropriate for the management of mild pain? What would you use? Meperidin, morphine, methadone, and moderate. I told you we have mild and moderate moderate and severe. You always start with the mild, which is the little M here, Motrin. This is an opiate, this is opiate. This one we stop using in Macaridin is bad. So morphine, Motrin is the right answer. And so this is a briefly pain, sleep, things that they can ask you in your question, in your test. I hope that helped. Leave a comment, subscribe. Um, down and then follow adapt and close if you want to but these are some of the things that you see on my channel um leave a comment and let me know what you think if there's any questions any topic uh, you worry about just let me know all the best of luck keep charging as always bye bye